Hi, this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer of Community Culture Showcase. So I have a wonderful author today who I'm going to speak with. And given it's the holiday season, I thought it would be absolutely appropriate that we would chat. And probably one of her themes is one of my most uh, endearing themes I think about. And that is our place in the universe. And who are we? And where is God in our lives? And do we all have a purpose? And does God know that purpose? So I am so very happy to have Barbara with me. And she has a new book out. And she's going to chat with us about the book, about her wonderful experiences um, in the ministry, as well as just a, a member of our community. So Barbara, thank you for coming. Thank you, Harriet. It's good to be here. So tell us a lot about, first of all, saying, say, say, saying yes to God, right? Mm -hmm. Did I say, uh, did I say that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great topic. I'm stumbling out of my mouth as I say it. So tell us a little bit about your inspiration for writing this book and a little bit about the book. Well, the book is autobiographical and inspirational. Um, and for many, many years, I'm, I am a retired Anglican priest. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been um, in ministry for probably 35 years, or maybe even longer. I can't, <laughs> I lost count. But anyway, over the years, uh, many, many people, when I'd go out to speak, have asked me, um, gee, you should write out your testimony. You should give your testimony. You should. Gee, one couple of people even said, boy, they ought to make a movie out of your life. And so I said, oh, yeah, this is Barbara with Chance, you know. So anyway, but um, this has been happening to me for years, and it's always been in the back of my mind that I would like to do it because we've had a lot of experience over the years as myself and my family. So, mm -hmm. um, And then finally, a friend of mine came to the house one day, and she said to me, I'm bringing up a friend. His name is Josh. He, he's an adjunct professor at Regent University. He does a lot of work in Israel mm -hmm. and uh, working with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And anyway, she said, he wants to meet you because I was telling him your story and about your children that you adopted and all of that. And so he says, he really wants to meet you. And so he came in and he said, I think they ought to make a movie about your mm -hmm. life. And I said, come on. This is like, you know, only if you can get Sandra Bullock to play me. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> so anyway, but we laughed, and but he said, no, seriously, I really think you should write your testimony out, and I think you should, you should write a book. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, this is probably time. So I decided to give it a go, and a year and a half later, sure, it's done. Now, the title, what inspired you to actually use that title? Well... I think that saying, why don't you kind of put it up and then maybe our, oh, our camera okay. can, well, here can it uh, pick it up there. Saying yes. yes to God. Yeah, yeah, saying yes to God. Well, it, you yeah. can kind of see it. So what inspired, it's a great title. Um, well, my whole life has been, you can either say yes to God when he asks you to do something, or you can say no. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that it was much better to say yes. And when you did say yes, there was a lot of benefits that came as a result of it. And there was a lot of joy, there's a lot of peace. There's um, also some struggles and trials mm -hmm. that you go through in the process of, of you know, walking out your relationship with God. But, but saying yes to God and be obedient to God when he asked us to do something is something that I feel is really important. It's something I think that he wants us mm -hmm. to do. He wants us to be obedient mm. to whatever it is he's asking us to do. And the title itself, uh, did you just, it just was a, an inspiration? Or what made you to even come up with just this particular, because I like the title. I think it was just an inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it kind of fit in with the story as we wrote it. Okay. And uh, I just really felt like, um, well, this is all about saying yes to God. You know, he asked me to do something. One time I was talking to God. I carry on conversations with him all the time. And I said, why do you? keep asking me to do things. He says, I know you'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right, that's a good reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your story that became the inspiration for the book, because you said we're talking primarily of something autobiographical. Yes, it is. So uh, I've had a very interesting life. I have, um, I have gone from rags to riches. Mm -hmm. I've gone from, um, I 
literally there's no reason why I should be alive today if it weren't for God, I believe, mm -hmm. because I've had four major surgeries. One of them was a liver transplant. Ooh. I had 185 blood transfusions mm. before they tested blood for AIDS, and I never got AIDS. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of miraculous stories that are all involved with that whole experience. Um, I became an ordained minister back in the 80s when people were not, uh, churches were not, especially evangelical, charismatic churches, were, uh, were not really ordaining women. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of a breakthrough. I was kind of a forerunner in that whole area. And then um, and back in the 80s, um, well, let me backtrack just mm -hmm. a little bit. Of in course. the 70s, um, we came into this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and we just wanted to give everything over to God and take responsibility, uh, give him responsibility for everything we wanted to do. So we got very radical, and we went to work for the um, Diocese of Norwich and the Catholic Church, and uh, we started a community home, a prayer community, for the Office of the Ministries to the Handicapped. And um, my husband was born with a physical impairment on his arm and one of his hands. And so he was always an inspiration to me because he never um, used it as an excuse not to do something. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he can seal a boat, he can fly an airplane, he can mm -hmm. ride a motorcycle, he can do anything anybody can do. He never let it stop him from doing anything. He's a very successful businessman, mm -hmm. and he decided to give up. Uh, we decided together that uh, he was going to give up his job and we were going to go and, and uh, work for the diocese. We donated all our, of our money to pay for the down payment for the community house that we were going to be living in. Mm -hmm. And we had lived with priests and nuns and uh, we had handicapped people coming to live with us. We have had ex -psychiatric, psychiatric patients mm -hmm. living with us. We had so many Different, different yeah, different people. personalities. Yes, yeah. yes, and you lived almost what you described, almost like a, a religious commune. In my it world. was really, yeah. literally, it was. We held everything in common. We didn't make any money. We lived mm. totally on donations. Mm. I'd make pancake batter on Monday morning, though, and by Friday there would still be pancake batter in the mm -hmm. bowl. So, God showed us miraculously, and I write about that in the book. Um, my husband prayed one day for $1,800 to pay for our bills and because that was a lot of money back in the mm -hmm. 70s, and we didn't have it. And one day a woman walked in off the street and handed my husband a bank check and said, Here, God told me to give this to you, and it was a check for $1,800. So it was miraculous things happen like that all the time. Right, right. But we were young. We were zealous. We knew very mm. little about the Word of God. We didn't know anything about conflict resolution and everything kind of fell apart. Mm. And so we, we were broke mm -hmm. and we lost everything. And my husband uh, and I, um, while we were working for the Office of the Handicap, there was a young girl, Anne Marie, and she used to sing. We had a choir all made up of handicapped people and we used mm. to go to different churches and we used to play. Right. And Anne Marie used to sing, you light up my life. And she was just so sweet. She was Down syndrome and, and uh -huh. My husband said one day, um, he just fell in love with Anna Marie, but he came home this one day and he said, God wants us to take in retarded children. I said, okay, I'm not going to argue with God. <laughs> so we actually literally started the second community training home in the state of Connecticut when they were deinstitutionalizing. Mm. And um, what we did was we had um, four clients that came to live with us, mm. and we lived on Laurel Hill in Norwich. Okay. Now, I used to drive down that street, and I used to say, God, I'm so glad I don't live on this street. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we were living. But it was, uh, it was really good because it, it just uh, it gave us some income. It gave us, uh, you know, and my, my husband was thinking about going, you know, looking for another job, a regular job as right. he had before. And um, one day, one of the guys that he had hired at his mm. company here in uh, Norwich I um, asked him if he wanted uh, his old position back as controller. And so he said, I don't know if I want to get back into the rat race of mm. working. And he, so he says, no, please come in. And I prayed. I said, oh, God, give him that job. Please give him that job. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so anyway, he, uh, he went in for the interview, and sure enough, he got a job as controller, and he ended up becoming a partner uh. in owning the business. So everything, there's a scripture that talks about you can give up husband, wife, brother, sister, farm, field, everything, uh, and I'll pay you back in abundance. Mm. And I took that literally, and so we did. We got back thousandfold everything that we gave mm. away. And it was pretty. So that was the start of everything. Mm. And it was the start of our working with children with developmental disabilities. Which you still do today? Well, our children have, um, we have Philip, who still lives with us, that we adopted, who has Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And we were in the group home for 10 years. And um, we had five, four clients, five clients. And then uh, Philip came to live with us, and Philip had Down syndrome, and he had a very severe heart condition mm. and lung condition. And when he came to live with us, he was only four years old, and he couldn't do anything. Right. Couldn't walk, talk. Mm. Just He was just one massive ball of loose muscle, mm. <laughs> literally. And, uh, but, um, and the doctors told us that he probably wouldn't live to pass puberty. Mm. Well, he's 38 years old today. Right, right, yeah, right. he has a very severe heart condition, very uh, pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. They came, went to Yale on Monday, and they said he's doing fantastic. Wow. And then we had another little girl. She was only, she was two and a half, came to live with us, Gretchen. And she was 15 and a half pounds. She wasn't, mm. she had failure to thrive. She had, uh, she was blind, totally blind, hydrocephalic seizure disorder, severely brain damaged, and mm. she had cerebral palsy. Oh, my. She was total care. Mm -hmm. And so she came, and she was just like this, just this little ball that you just wanted to pick up and hug and never let go. Mm. And uh, they told us not to get attached to her, that mm. uh, she wouldn't probably live until she was three years old. And uh, I said... Mm -mm. Not my Gretchen. Mm. She lived till she was 27. She passed away about five years ago. Oh. And uh, she, she was quite the gem. She was a wonderful, wonderful person. And it was through Philip and Gretchen, we adopted both of them because right. they came in as babies and we never did want to let them go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but after about 10 years into having the group home, we went to, um, I was very ill and I needed to have a liver transplant. Mm -hmm. My husband says, we need to close the group home and so one of my employees actually took some of the clients it, to live with her and they lived on the same street that we did mm. so we still had constant contact with them right and uh it you know we were still a family right. and you know it worked out really well and you actually have biological children as well yes i have three biological children i have a daughter christine who has her PhD and she's the superintendent of schools down in Bethel, Connecticut. Oh, okay. I have another son who um, established his own business, very successful software company. That's a virtual office that he has employees all over the country, uh, but he lives up in Maine. Mm -hmm. He's very successful. And then I have another daughter, Tracy, who's a farmer. Oh, okay. Yes. Here in Connecticut? Oh, yeah. And we all live in the farm together Ah. in Hanover. Oh, in Hanover, Connecticut? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. So where is that? In the... It's 10 minutes northeast of Norwich. Okay. Right All next right. to Canterbury. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So did they feel did they feel somewhat slighted since these were children that you were adopting who required so much of your time and attention? Yeah. Gretchen, uh, Tracy will always say, I was the princess until mm. Gretchen came. Uh. But then I tell Gretchen, mm. Tracy... I get them all confused. That's all right. I tell Tracy that I was the queen until Gretchen came. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, obviously there must have been some, mm -hmm. you know, they Feel got knocked off their pedestal. Yes. But in the book, uh, my biological children write in the book about stories. They tell stories about their life living with us mm. in the context of having the group home. And they're hysterical. They're so funny. And... One is my son Paul is teaching Alan how to eat Cheerios. Now, it took me 10 years to teach Alan how to put on his socks. Mm. But Alan, when he ate a bowl of Cheerios, would pick up his spoon and he would pick up one Cheerio at a time. And my son said, no, Alan, this is how you do it. And he would take the spoon and he would pick up a, you know, a big, big, big bunch. Big, right. big bunch. Right. And, and <laughs> Alan would look at him and he'd go, <laughs> 
and he would just pick up one. <laughs> one at a time. That was his <laughs> was, way. That's it right. was just his way. Uh, yes. And you couldn't convince him to do it any other way. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So did these children, these uh, adopted children, live with you then full time? And, and, uh, all, all the time. All right? the time. All yeah, the and our son Philip is still living with us. Oh, okay. Yes. That's yeah. wonderful. Yes. And do they did they go to school or did you homeschool them? How? Oh no, I could never homeschool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. could never do that. Uh, no, they went to a school system. I was very well known in this knowledge. One time, I think we had five clients in the in the in knowledge schools. public school okay. system. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, and Gretchen, I became an advocate for them because Gretchen, who is severely, you know, so severely disabled, and the education that um, she had was, I think, phenomenal. Oh, okay. And um, there was one of the professors at UConn, I can't recall his name right now, but he came to uh, uh, and did an evaluation on Gretchen and mm -hmm. developed a whole... Uh, individual education program for her, and it was phenomenal. Mm. At one point, I went into the classroom, and the teacher was mixing spaghetti with chocolate milk in the blender to feed her. And I thought, would you eat that? Oh, you know, that was, <laughs> this, it, this was ridiculous. And so I knew from that point on, I had to right be on top of things. So we had a PPT, okay, uh, for you, Gretchen, and you can tell the, the people what parent, parent pupil teacher conference, which really, it was so funny. You have a PPT to develop an IEP, which is the Individual Education Program. And I'm sure that language is all changed now because they always change language. Right. And, um, but um, there were 15 people there. We had psychologists and professors mm. and teachers and the superintendent of school came because this was like an important. And um, I know it cost the taxpayers a lot of money, right. but it was so worth it. Because mm -hmm. I think it set a precedent too for other children who were coming into the system, who were also quite disabled. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, there was. I, I'm sure it was just the first off the bat. People say these kids are not capable of doing anything. Yeah. And of course, you have to change minds. Absolutely. And one of the greatest things um, we had, uh, Gretchen, if she knew who you were mm -hmm. and she recognized your voice when you came into the room, she would get so upset. And she would reach out for you like this, and she would she would want you to come over, and she would start smiling, and she couldn't communicate right. other than grunts, and mm -hmm. um, but she was you knew that she wanted to see you to come over and say hello to her, right? And so people used to come in, and they would sit on the couch and say hi, Gretchen, mm -hmm. and they would put their arm around her and give her a kiss, and she would just put her head on the person's chest, mm. and you know there was something about that. Everybody who came in. They would just sit there the whole time hugging Gretchen. Mm. But th she brought a peace into people's lives that I can't even explain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole idea of saying yes to God, and, and uh, everybody is unique, and every person is unique and wonderful in the sight of God. And every person has a purpose regardless of who they are. Right. I don't care what nationality, what ethnic group you belong to, whether you're disabled, what, whatever it is, everybody has a purpose. And Gretchen's purpose, I believe, was just to love, mm -hmm. you know, and to bring peace into the lives of people. And it, it was, it, I saw it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And she um, obviously could be very manipulative and she could be a brat, you mm. know, and, and especially when she was sick and she couldn't communicate verbally right. to let us know what was wrong. That was very difficult. But when people whoever was there in the home mm -hmm. and they would come in for a visit she they gravitated towards her because they it was like unconditional love right and it didn't make any difference who you were did you uh, advocate in the political system of trying to get uh, other people to do what you were doing, bringing into their homes and adopting kids like this so they could have it some chance? You know, at one point I spoke to the Department of, um, then it was called Department of Mental Retardation and to Social Services Department, DDS, I think it was. Anyway, and they were trying to combine, and they were trying to work on a program for, um, um, the two organizations to work together to get more people to adopt um, physically disabled children as well right. as mentally disabled. Right. And I challenged them mm -hmm. to come and spend a weekend at my house. Just do that because you'll learn more in one weekend than you'll learn in, with all of your textbooks. Right. And what I learned was um, that our system <laughs> was terrible. <laughs> I mean, they try hard and they're overworked. 
but they don't understand. They think, because you've got it in a book, and mm -hmm. it says, this is how you do it, this is going to work, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I learned the most was, when you have a person who's developmentally delayed or physically handicapped, they're normal for who they are. Mm -hmm. Just as much as you're normal and I'm normal. Right. And because people used to ask me all the time, do you have special training to do this? Mm -hmm. I said, no, mm. no. But you know what? I just treat them as if they're normal. Right. And I learn from them. Right. And I learn what to do and what not to do. And it worked. Mm -hmm. It worked. We had a very successful, we won awards oh. from the state, you know, and the people respected us. And it was an amazing experience. And if I hadn't been sick, mm -hmm. gotten so sick, I probably mm -hmm. still would have been doing it. I see. Okay. Yeah. And do you remain someone who's an advocate for trying to get these kids placed? Because I can imagine it's very, it must be very difficult. I haven't done that mm -hmm. actively over the last few years because I've been so involved with ministering. And, right. Um, I travel internationally. I've done a lot of international travel. I've done a lot of um, speaking itinerant work. And mm -hmm. so that really was taking an awful lot of my time. And um, I was telling you pre-interview that right. I am a, a forerunner. I'm a starter. Mm -hmm. Maintaining is not my gift. Okay. And so I will find somebody, if you've got an idea and you want to do it, and if there's somebody who wants to be an advocate, I've done. I've helped parents. Mm. I'm hoping that this book oh, we'll will open up help. some eyes and stuff. Yes, sure, I'm sure, sure. Because I think, you know, when I was thinking about my audience for reading it, it can teach people a lot of things. It can teach people about faith. Mm -hmm. uh, it can teach people about the importance of each person as being unique and having a purpose in life. Right. Um, it, it can teach people th that trusting in God is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, but especially, uh, it teaches that when you're challenged by something mm -hmm. and you don't think, because so many people come to me and they say, ah, I can't do that, that's too hard. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, God could never want me to do that, that's way too hard. And I thought, well, when Jesus chose his 12 disciples, you know, they were fishermen, <laughs> tax collectors. You know, they weren't missionaries. They weren't, you right. know, they didn't have the education uh, that others had. And so I, I said that uh, nobody, if you're not qualified, you're probably a good person for God <laughs> to use. <laughs> and you can do it. And the challenge can be exciting, and it causes growth, and it's, it's just a great experience. Well, I would assume your whole life story is one of constant challenge. It has been. And obviously, you get peace of mind for that. But yeah. you know, there must be a restlessness within you that says, well, I've done this, I've conquered this mountain, but my God, there's, there's a whole range for me to do. Yeah. Uh, do you get that sense that there's that kind of restlessness in you that, that says, there, I, got, I can push more. There's more for me to do out yeah. there. Well, one of my biggest passions now is, is really my husband and I started a company called Generational Solutions. Okay. And it's really about us taking all the experiences that we've had. We've been married 50 years. Mm hmm and taken all this experience and um, what we've gone through, what we've learned, um, and how can we take it and put it into other people's lives? So we, we do mentoring, we do coaching, okay. we do a lot of strategic planning for businesses. My husband was a very successful businessman. Right. And uh, so we do a lot of strategic planning with businesses, with ministries. Uh, we've worked as far away as Chile Mm. Um, I've been to Santiago about 16 times. Wow. So we've worked uh, quite a bit mm -hmm. in South America to Texas. <laughs> you know, yeah, we've, right. we just got back from Honduras. Uh huh. We were working with the Children's Rescue Mission in Honduras. And uh, so the work is the same, similar, but not the same. Okay. Does that make sense? Tell me, like, for example, you just came back from Honduras. Mm -hmm. So. While you were in Honduras, you know, what exactly did you do with, with the, with the uh, mission? We've been working with this friend of ours from Norwalk. His name is Miguel Heron. He's actually from Honduras himself. Okay. And he started the Children's Rescue Mission. And for years, he's been asking me to go. And mm. I have just didn't have the time. And so finally, 
my life has slowed down a little bit now, so I thought, we're going to go to Honduras, and we did. Mm -hmm. And um, Miguel feeds 1,500 children and seniors every week. Wow. The poverty in Honduras is horrendous. Mm -hmm. But Miguel has built a beautiful children's rescue mission, he calls it. Mm -hmm. And the children come there twice a week to get fed. They have a three-story school building that they're building and they're just going to be opening it January 1st I believe is going to be the opening date of that school Wow! and he's building a be it's a beautiful beautiful facility and all of it's paid for he's done a lot of work and fundraising and mm -hmm. um, but he wanted to to create an environment that um, would help the children to feel um, self-worth Mm. that they're worth something, It's uh, that they're significant, and God really wants what's best for them. So he created this incredibly beautiful facility for these children to come in and learn. And um, he has uh, gotten people to donate musical instruments, and so they have this whole orchestra. Mm. And uh, we went to see this little boy who was homebound, and he was in a wheelchair, a makeshift wheelchair. It was one of those white plastic lawn chairs, you know okay, the kind yeah. that stack? Yeah. And it was stuck inside a frame with two wheels. Oh my. And okay. he had an operation on his legs and they were sitting up on the, uh, uh, resting his legs on the chair in front of him to get to his house. He could never get out of that house in the wheelchair. Mm. It would be almost impossible because it was all dirt and ruts mm. in the ground and it, it just, and people, dirt floors, I mean, but he was sitting there playing the violin, and he was mm. so proud that he was able to do that for us. And right. it was such a blessing to be able to be there and to work with these kids mm. and adults. And that for us was really a fact-finding mission to find out what, you know, um, we could do to help them. So then I did, um, worked with the pastors, and we spoke. My husband Ashley has a ministry working with seniors here in um, oh, Connecticut. Okay. And he goes to Atria, for example, down in Waterford, and he works with the dementia patients. Mm. And he just goes in there and he talks to them and talks to them about going to heaven and mm. what it takes to go to heaven. And it's a journey. And he sings with them and he just ministers to them and they love it. And wow. there's a peace that comes you know, with them, and so it was, we worked with the seniors when we were down there, and they were just wonderful, wonderful people. Do they live in the school, or no? no they don't live in the school. Students. They live at home okay. when they, because some of the children, when they come, they come to the, to the children's rescue mission. They actually have six villages that they work with, mm -hmm. but they bring little bowls so that they can bring home food to the rest of their family. Yes, my, my cousin actually, uh, one of my cousins was actually in the Peace Corps in, mm. in Honduras. So mm -hmm. I, can, I can tell you, you know, some of the experiences mm -hmm. he's told us about uh, uh, living in, in a, like a, almost like a hut. Yeah. And he slept on a hammock because there were so many critters underneath. Oh, yeah. Um, uh -huh. And mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was really quite primitive. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was his first exposure to really poor, yeah. poor, I mean, like, not... New York City poor, but no. really poor people who have literally absolutely nothing. Oh, I know. I, I visited a few of those places. And there's a, so this Christmas, for example, um, we've made a decision as a family that we're not going to give Christmas presents. Oh, okay. We're going to give all the money we would spend on Christmas to Honduras. And Miguel gives everybody a bag of rice and a bag of beans. And this year he wants to give them a chicken. How excellent. So everybody can have a chicken dinner for Christmas. And That's so wonderful. we're going to use the proceeds, what we would spend on Christmas, and we would give it to them so they can buy chickens. No, that's, that's great. Now, and he, of course, uh, Miguel is a native, so he, yes. did he go back to where he came from? Yes, or? he's Tupo Pacente. Okay. And I met his parents when oh. we were there, and his sister, and his sister works at the mission, and his mm. parents are wonderful. Yeah, because, of course, the other terrible thing about Honduras of maybe the last 20 years, of course, it's become extraordinarily violent with the drug trafficking. It's very dangerous. Yes, yes. yes. So yeah. uh, I didn't realize that until mm -hmm. I actually, the last night I was there, how dangerous it was. I mean, there's some very nasty boys there yeah. doing yeah. just some yeah. awful stuff. Yeah. And so uh, it's it's wonderful, and and uh, I guess you felt that violence. But do they give Miguel and the kids sort of like a 
like a free pass, so to speak? Well, we were two outside, two hours outside of the main city. Mm -hmm. So the night before, we felt didn't feel danger. The, although every place we stayed, we were very well protected. High wall fences with mm -hmm. barbed wire mm -hmm. around the top. Um, but the um, when we went into the city, the capital city, right? We stopped to get gas, and there was a guy with a shotgun there. <laughs> and I thought, what is he doing with that gun? And so, well, in case somebody decides to rob the place, right, and I right. thought, oh, oh, I'm realizing what's happening. And then the last night we were there, we stayed at a hotel because mm -hmm. we had to get up early to go to the airport the next morning. And uh, when we were there, we, we got out of, um, we were going out to dinner. But we had to hire a driver from the hotel mm -hmm. who came with us, stayed with us the whole time we went out to dinner, and then took us back to the hotel. And going to the airport, we had our suitcases in the back of a pickup truck. Okay. So we, the guys in the uh, parking garage tied all of our suitcases together so nobody could reach in and you just take grab it, it right. and take off with it. Yeah, so that was, uh. I thought, okay, this is a very interesting <laughs> scenario. But it was such a beautiful city, and it was one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been into in my whole entire life. And mm. I've been to a lot of different countries. And it was, it was just magnificent. The mountains and the valleys, and the, they were just all over the place. Right, but yeah. of course, um, that poverty has bred some awful uh, yes, scenarios yeah. in terms of having, you know, mm -hmm. people wanting desperately yeah. to leave that country. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, where else have you been in terms of uh, similar kinds of projects? I've been to Africa. I was the president of the board for the Destiny Africa Children's Choir oh, in Kampala, okay. uh, Uganda. So I've been mm -hmm. to Uganda. And uh, the air is very, very poor as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, Arnold Mwangi, who is the head of that ministry, is doing a phenomenal job as well. And he has, Miguel and, and Arnold both kind of have the same vision where they, they really want to raise up people in, in the country to become part of the country, to give back to the country right. what it needs. Right. Raise them up with moral values and Christian values and to, um, you know, Trust God for helping. Say yes to God and get out there and do something great for your country. Right. Get rid of the corruption. Right. No. right. Yes. Yeah. And to train the next yes. generation of leaders. That's what it is. It's all about training the next generation of leaders. And that's really what we want to do with what we have with uh, Generational Solutions. Uh, you know, so we've worked with a lot of new entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and who want to start businesses, nonprofit organizations. In this country or abroad? Yes, here. Oh, mm -hmm. here too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've done a lot here. Yeah, right here in Connecticut. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get your message out in terms of the people even know about you to, it, to inquire what you, services you it's offer? It's interesting. For, word of mouth uh -huh. is the biggest. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I'm not really good at keeping up my Facebook page. <laughs> Right. And I looked the other day, and I have six new views on generational mm -hmm. solutions, and I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> how, <laughs> did that, how did that happen? Yes, yes. So, but I'm not, um, that's not my gift. Right. I'm going to do a blog for saying yes to God, though, and I'm going to ah. have a website. But the generational solutions is, that's been, we really felt like that was another thing that God asked us to do. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's just been word of mouth. We mm -hmm. did one class with about 15 people. At uh, in Mystic, okay, and we lived in Mystic for years, mm. and um, so we did it there. And uh, from there, word just spread, mm -hmm. and um, and now we've worked, we've done work all over the nation, mm -hmm. and we've done it with um, in international mm -hmm. ministries that I've worked with, and we've we're going to do it with the, the ministry in Honduras. That's oh. one of the roles. We're going to help them do more strategic planning. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, worked with a large organization out in Texas, and we, um, we work with a film company called Invicta, it's, okay. and we are producing um, a film. Actually, we're the executive producers yeah. uh, for that, and it's called The Identity Project, and it'll be released at Easter time in... Um, 2016, oh. and it's a full-length feature film. Okay, and um, so we 
you know, so we did strategic planning with them, you know, and worked. We, and oftentimes what happens if we find a business that we think is going to be viable, mm -hmm. then we'll invest in it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's been... It's been very... Oh, venture capitalists, is that it? Well, yeah. <laughs> like sort small of, scale? On a small scale, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're not investing millions, but in some instances, it's been quite a bit. Right. Can't say everything has been 100% successful. Right. And those are kind of the hills and valleys yeah. you go through. You know? <laughs> well, you've already <laughs> known what it was like to be have nothing, so... That's right. Everything think, after that is yeah. better. <laughs> I, said, I tell my husband, I think it's easier to be poor than rich. Oh. You know? But nobody really wants to be too poor. No, they don't. No, they don't. No. What's, no. Uh, what's kind of the message that you bring to you? What's the unique message that you bring that, you know, the, the Small Business Administration is out there. There's a whole bunch of other groups out there. Yeah. Economic uh, Development uh, Offices from every town from sure. here to the end of uh, to California. What's your unique you think message? It's a generational solutions? Yes, because I must be reflective of who you and your husband are. I mean, it's not, I didn't think come it goes, out of the box. No, I think it goes back to the fact that um, that we believe in the uniqueness of every individual. Mm -hmm. We believe in the, the purpose. And our unique message, we invest in the people. We take them from feas concept to feasibility. But then um, we're not going to let you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, you, if you're struggling, you can call us anytime and we're going to come and help you. If you have... Um, and it, it could be a business that's floundering, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't know what to do. And right. so we have the abilities to be able to um, come alongside and help you. And um, it, it's, it's, it's just been a very interesting and a fun experience. This especially for my husband. Okay. Because he loves business. He mm -hmm. loves it. And if he can do it and he d does it to... In his eyes, he's glorifying God. Mm. You know, and maybe you understand this. In in the Hebrew expression of worshiping God, you worship God in every single thing that you do. Yes. There's no difference between the secular and the sacred. And I think that's something that Christians should really learn to grasp and hold on to. And so we feel like every single thing that we do is worship unto God. Mm. And so whether it's running a business or whether it's going to church on Sunday or it's mentoring or it's going to Honduras, whatever it is we're doing, you know, I, I had to change Gretchen's diaper, mm -hmm. you know, and Tracy will tell stories about that in my book because mm. she was her caregiver for a while, mm. my daughter Tracy. Mm. And it, you know, it, it wasn't always a pleasant thing, I, I but bet. I've, you do it unto God, and mm -hmm. you offer it up as an act of worship, then it can smell like roses. Mm. It doesn't literally, but you know what I mean. You right. have a real peace about it. It's, it's necessary, and it's for a greater purpose. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And is that part of the message that you give that makes you so absolutely different than most is out there that say, you know what, I, I see in you something that's absolutely unique. Mm -hmm. And that if you do, you, you know, I would assume some of them are not believers per se. No. Uh, and so you kind mm -hmm. of instill in them the sense that you are unique. We see you as unique because God sees you as unique. Yeah. And you have this opportunity. Absolutely. But yes. it's also part of the message that once you've received some kind of uh, success, that it's your obligation to give back to somebody else in the community, that it's not simply just to get rich. No. I have no interest in getting rich, you know, and, and I think, what else do I need? I have a beautiful home, mm -hmm. you know, I have goats and chickens and <laughs> we have a great big Great Pyrenees dog, you oh, know, okay. we have 30 acres of land. I mean, what, do you, what more do you need than that? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't need anything more than that. And so, and I have, you know, I have a wonderful family. Um, my husband will ask me, what do you want for Christmas? I'm a cappuccino maker. I mean, what do I need? I right. don't need that. I can exactly. go to Starbucks. <laughs> so it, but I, I, it really is to give back. Mm -hmm. It really is. I don't want, um, it's not important for me to acquire a lot of things. And we've moved a lot. And people say, how can you move so many times? Right. Because I don't get attached okay. to the things that I have. 
The materialistic stuff. The materialistic stuff. stuff. Right. I enjoy it. Right. Don't get me wrong. Right, right. I love having a nice warm house and a comfortable bed and, mm. you know. And a car that works. And a car that works, <laughs> yes. And even if it's a nice car. <laughs> I got a funny story. Yes, please, share. I drove up to church one day uh, when I was working full-time as pastor in a church in New London, and uh, I was the associate pastor. This is a long time ago, and I had a Mercedes-Benz, mm -hmm. and it was not a new car. Mm -hmm. It was used, and we always bought used cars, and it was an older model, but you know, they don't change in right. looks, right. so look who soon. knew that it wasn't mm -hmm. new? Right. And so I drove up to church, and I was sitting in my office, and the door was open, and somebody walked by and says, oh, it looks like Barbara got a new car. <laughs> it's like, they knew that was my car. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was, we never bought a new car. Mm. But now that you're living comfortably, do you finally buy new cars? I did. The last car yes, I bought was new, yes. 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 Yeah. You yeah. want to treat yourself as you get a little bit older, right? <laughs> Few niceties, a few, few niceties. niceties. Yeah. Yes, it's yes. a comfortable. Well, you, but you know why I bought this new car? Mm. It gets 50 miles to the gallon. Oh, is it a Prius it's or something? It's a hybrid. It's yes. a Honda Accord. Yes. 50 miles to the gallon. I was driving an Audi, and it was. I have a God story. Yes, please. I went. My husband said it's time for you to get a new car. And I said, Oh, really? Yes, I want you to, we're going to go look at Audis. I said, Audis? <laughs> They're very expensive. He says, no, come on. I want you to, because um, the car I was driving was very low, and it really hurt my back. Ah. And he said, you need to get a high car. So I said, all right. We went in. Well, I looked at this car, and it was an Audi Q5. And I said, wow. We pray about everything mm -hmm. that we buy. We ask God, is this all right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, one night I was in bed, I, we met this guy. Jerry says, I want you to come back and meet the salesman. He is the nicest guy in the world. You're going to love this guy. Said, okay, I'll go back and meet the salesman. So I did. And sure enough, he was a really nice guy. And he never tried to sell me a car. But what he did was he, he, uh, we just carried on a conversation. So we're finished and took the car for a test drive. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, We'll get back to you on Friday. I'm going to do some comparative shopping, which I probably would have had no intention of doing. Right. But anyway, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just had this voice in my head saying, buy that car. <laughs> I said, is that you, God? Because mm. I said, I, you know, I want, um, it's an expensive car. Yes. I said, I want you to buy that car, and I want you to go in there and tell you I'm buying that car because I want that man to know how much I care for him, and I want you to tell him that. And he said, uh, so I said, oh, all right. So I told my husband, he says, if God wants you to do that, then go ahead and do it. Okay. So I thought, this is crazy. So I walked into the car dealership, and I said to the guy, I'm buying the car. But the reason why I'm buying the car is because God wanted me to tell you how important you are to him and what you do is important. And he looked at me, and I thought he was going to start crying. <laughs> well, you know what? I thought, well, this guy's going to just give his life over to Jesus, and everything is going to be wonderful. You know, he never did that. Mm -hmm. But he, I coached him. Oh, okay. And he wanted to go to work, and he hated selling cars. Oh. He wanted to go to work at a different place where they worked with uh, drug rehab, and, uh, oh. and you had to have drug rehab and, and uh, uh, mental, mental issues, health. mental uh -huh. health issues. And I had a connection, and I called him, and he ended up going to work for the company. Interesting. So it, it, there is a purpose. See, there he is has a, a purpose. purpose. There was a purpose in your buying it yes, from him yes. because there was another purpose for him in his yeah. life. Yeah, and that I is... enjoyed the car <laughs> until I had to stop paying thousands of dollars of repairs, and I said, that's it. That's, That's it. it. Let me ask you, because you're in the religious realm here, uh -huh. uh, what do you think about something like uh, Pope Francis making a big issue? We're talking about uh, you're so proud of this car that uh, is a hybrid yeah. that uh, they, we should, that is us. We are the stewards, as the Bible yeah. tells us. Yeah. We are the stewards of his, uh, of yeah. his world. I think, I think Pope Francis is doing tremendous work. Mm -hmm. He's doing an awful lot of good. 
I think he's doing an awful lot of good very fast, mm -hmm. which to me is a little scary. Okay. But, um, I mean, he's, he's very, um, he's very well liked. And he's making people, uh, well, for people who might, ha uh, particularly people poli think. Well, like politicians who would, you know, yeah. shrug off this sure. and say it's, you know, it's a bunch of loonies yeah. or yeah. a bunch of communists saying right. this stuff. And here he is talking, one, about taking care of the poor. Yeah. That it is mm -hmm. our... Our obligation. It is, and then certainly that we are the stewards mm -hmm. of this of this earth, mm -hmm. and that it is our obligation to yeah. take good care of it, yes. so that our future generations mm -hmm. can enjoy it as mm -hmm. well. So, that's a message we have not heard from no. a major religious figure. No. No, at no, all. At all is right. Probably at all. never. Yeah. Yes. I mean, some yeah. of them have spoken about, of course, the poor. Mm -hmm. Not recently, mm -hmm. but some of them. Yeah. Uh, but certainly that. This, and he's not a young man, he's like in his late 70s. Yes. So maybe he's in a hurry because he figures, <laughs> God told him he may not I have the, uh, 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 life is not unlimited. Yeah. That he yeah. had to get that me message out yeah. quickly. Yeah. You know, I think about that because they just signed this accord in Paris mm -hmm. about climate, can, you know, the fact that the climate mm -hmm. is burning up and what sure. are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And I think to some degree, um, I think politicians, especially particularly in this country, would mm -hmm. completely ignore that issue yes. had it not been for him just uh -huh. recently mm -hmm. coming forward and telling the Congress, mm -hmm. you know, this is this is what your responsibility mm -hmm. is, um, and and it's it's a, it's a great me it's a message we've not heard from no. a religious figure. No. So it's kind of easy yeah. as the as the world, not the country, yeah. but the mm -hmm. world becomes less and less religious or. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't think it's necessarily religion per se, is tied to a church. Mm -hmm. You're right. People have walked away from going to church, they have. to paying membership. Um, I don't necessarily think that they want to walk away from God. Do you, do you find that in terms of some of the people that you visit with, in terms of, you know, even in this country? It depends on what age bracket we're talking about. So it young people are more skeptical than older people? Mm -hmm. And yeah. is it the skepticism of just youth or, or something very special about the skepticism? You know, the, the youth, there's a big movement in the church, in the Christian church. There's a lot of supernatural happenings. And um, there's the whole um, thing about doing what Jesus did, mm. not the bracelet, what would Jesus do? You mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about? But uh, the whole thing about Jesus, you know, he healed the blind, the sick, the lame, the demonized. And... and um, there's a lot of young people who are very, very involved in in uh, in church, but not necessarily in the the church on Sunday morning per se. Um, there's a lot of prayer movements that are happening among young people in the Christian church. That's very exciting, mm. uh, and they're seeing a lot of supernatural events happening where um, people, they see people getting healed when they pray for them. And mm. they, um, I know a couple of people who have seen people raised from the dead. Mm. And um, so I said, if I die, don't, don't bring me back, please. <laughs> you don't want to be Lazarus. I don't want to be Lazarus, <laughs> no. But uh, unless God tells me to come back, then I will. But anyway, but there, there's that kind of a movement happening. But, and I think that the supernatural um, attracts young people. I believe that, uh, well, look at how they're involved. They, they like to watch movies about vampires mm. and all of the, you know, the blood-sucking, right. boorish kinds of things that are in the movies today and all of that that's so unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what in God, who is God, the creator of the universe, if, you know, um, is... is a supernatural God, then why aren't we seeing that on the earth today? Mm -hmm. And But we are beginning to see that more and more and more. And I'm actually involved with a couple of ministries that are very involved in that. So, um, yeah, so I think young people want to see the supernatural, mm -hmm. and I think that will bring them back to church. Um, they want, they're interested in relationship because young people don't really have relationship. They, they don't have relationship with their parents. They mm -hmm. don't want to have... And so to have a relationship, to teach young people how to have a relationship with God and, um, and, and have them work that out in their life is very valuable. That draws young people into church. Mm -hmm. um, seniors, I think we've lost a lot of young families, especially mainline denominations. Mm 
uh, not necessarily in non-denominational churches. Okay. Um, I see in the, in the Christian church, I see there's a lot of churches that this specialize. This church over here is uh, charismatic. This one's evangelical. Mm. This one's Pentecostal. This one is uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need a church that embraces all of those things. I see. I think that, you know, it would be an, an apostolic church. It would be a church that would come together where we, we teach people how to hear the voice. of. It, it's called the Fivefold Ministries in the book of Ephesians. It's apostle, prophet, uh, evangelist, pastor, teacher. You know, and we need all of that in the church so we can have a church that's well-balanced and, and uh, it teaches people all aspects of Christianity. Well, you know, historically, uh, the, the Christian church has been divided uh, over all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And not, not only the Catholics against Protestants, mm -hmm. where people went to war and killed each other, yeah. but even within the Protestants, I mean, the Calvinists believe this, and the mm -hmm. Lutherans believe that, and the Methodists believe this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's historically we've had lots of precedent mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. having very real, I mean, people went to wars sure. over what we would might think of as minor differences right. in, in theology or rituals. Yeah. So there's, there's been a, a really big, strong... I was the founder of the Connecticut House of Prayer. Mm -hmm. Started in 1999. And mm -hmm. its purpose was to pray for unity across and denominational and cultural barriers for the purpose of transformation. Okay. And it was to bring the church together. And so we were very successful in many, many ways of, of actually doing that. We would have meetings where we would get about 170 pastors from all different denominations together. And that kind of evolved later on through the years into an organization called Impact Connecticut. And oh. we had churches. And so once a year, there's been a big conference. So the last two years, there's been a big conference where all the churches, all mm -hmm. the denominations have been coming together. And we're seeing that kind of a movement happening all across the country, all around the world, literally. Yes. There's a movement because... The prayer movement, since about the late 90s, mm -hmm. maybe it's 95 on, has grown and grown and grown. And so we're seeing a lot of results, uh, uh, a lot of things changing as a result of prayer. Okay. Not everything that we want changed is changing, but we are seeing some really good positive things happening which is very exciting. And what's the unifying mission, motion, idea that brought, brings all these people together? The common denominator is that we're all believers in Jesus Christ as Savior. Okay. And that's, that's the common denominator. And so you can be a Pentecostal mm. and worship and shout and praise God really loud. You mm. can be a charismatic or speak in tongues. You can be an evangelical and you know, you're conservative. Uh, but the word of God is there, and you can all come together, and you can pray together because of Jesus. And so and that's, that's the, the common denominator, and that's unifying the church. And you think that, that that's going to be the future into the moving forward, that we're going to get into a unified Protestant church? I don't think it become okay. one church, no. No, no mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, it, that would, um, I don't think that will happen, no. Okay. I mean, because I mean, that's Catholicism is sure. basically one, one church. church. I mean, you know, there's, you mm -hmm. know, sex and a few fractions out sure. there, but it's, it is one church. Yeah, and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, and it wasn't until Martin Luther came along and, and the Reformation, and he changed everything. Yes, he yeah, did. No. <laughs> Good for Martin Luther. Not that I'm opposed to Catholics. I'm not. Right, right. No, I we love don't Catholic. have an idea. No, no, we don't. Right, no, right, no. Right. So, and, and the reason why people want to be unified is that they see that, uh, they, they see things that are wrong with the world and they want to change them and they think that's the only format for them making that change? I think for, personally, I, I think that they believe that as they come together, um, and I can't quote the psalm, but it's, in, it's, it's uh Oh, my goodness, I know it so well. It's uh, blessed are those who come together in unity. Mm -hmm. um, and it talks about uh, um, there's a blessing that comes from heaven when the church comes together in unity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that that blessing will produce something really great for uh, the state, for the nation, um, when, when people are in one accord, mm -hmm. good things happen. Right, you right, know? right. And it's not a 
takeover. It's not a... Um, I win, you lose. Right. It's yes. not that at all. Mm -hmm. but there, there's a blessing, and, and let's see what God will do with that. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll, he'll create something positive to happen. Um, it's up to God. Okay. You know, we just, he says, come together in unity. We have to say yes to God. And we do it, and then we wait to see what God will do. That's wonderful. And that's kind of the premise of the book. Okay. Actually. And tell us, do you have some um, uh, local events going on where you're going to be out there um, signing books, talking about your book? I'll be at the, um, at the Christian Bookstore in Groton here mm -hmm. with Dennis McGee's. Um, I'll do a book signing there. The book will be out first week of January. Okay, so it's not available yet. It's not available yet. Um, there is a website. People can contact me if they want to pre-order a book. Oh, okay. Um, I can. I will make sure that they get it as soon as it comes off the press. Um, I'm going to be speaking. And there's your, speaking. there's your information. There it it's is. It's at the Generational yes. Solutions LLC. Yes, yes. And they go to the website, and they can yes. go ahead and order mm -hmm. the book before yeah. before anybody else has it. Just email me directly. Oh, okay. Just use, email me directly. Right. Use that Barbara Generational Solutions LLC.com. Correct. And you'll get a, a book before anybody mm -hmm. else does. Absolutely. And uh, when is this movie coming out? Are you going to have information on your website about this movie? We have a website. We'll have it on the web, Invicta website. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it'll be coming out in uh, um, um, Easter. Of Easter. 2016. Here in, in Connecticut as well? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, I well, think that's the plan. Great. Mm -hmm. yeah. National release or just Connecticut? Oh, it's a national. It's going to ah, be a national okay. release. National I release. believe. We have, I don't know if that's actually been decided yet. This, that's uh, classified information oh, right now, oh, I guess. Okay. To be, de <laughs> I to be determined. <laughs> to be determined, yes. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes. that's that's great. So you're going to be at the Christian Bookstore here in Groton. I will. And yes. any other uh, and the advertisement will go up for that. Okay. Yeah. And they should find out what you're doing and your comings and goings and the events vis-a-vis -vis your website. Yeah, and I'll have a blog. I'm starting a blog saying yes to God. If they want to sign up for my blog, they can email me and they can uh, I'll put them sign them up for the blog. And then they just receive it automatically. Yes, they'll okay. receive it automatically. And what are you going to do? Do you have your first uh, inclination about what the first <coughs> blog uh, writing is going to be? Yeah, I'm just going to kind of give an introduction mm -hmm. to what it means to say yes to God. Okay. And uh, what it's meant for me and maybe tell a funny story. Okay. I like funny stories. Then. Yeah, well, life should be funny because it sometimes should. it's so cruel. Oh, it <laughs> is, yeah. <laughs> we like... have very funny stories in the book and we have very sad so I had my proofreader, one last proofreader, going through it the other day. And she said, I'm on page 12, and I started crying. <laughs> and I thought, oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen next? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, Barbara, it's been an absolute pleasure oh, thank to you. have you on the show to it's talk about, uh, about your book, mm -hmm. who you are, what you've done, all the fascinating things. Again, saving yes to, saying, saying yes, yes to, to God. God. It's a little mouthful, but yeah. definitely... Keep mm -hmm. it in mind. Get it onto the website. See your books. Mm -hmm. Buy your books. Come and hear you talk. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you may find yourself in a, a better life. Amen. 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 Thank you, Harriet. So this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. I wish all of my viewers a wonderful, happy holidays. And um, we take this opportunity to thank you all for visiting us and also you can find me not only on TV but online in my community culture showcase .weebly.com and you can see some old shows. So this has been a wonderful 2015. I thank my viewers and I thank always my guests. Thank you very much Barbara. You're welcome. Thank you.